Now, this passage is every pastor's dream. You never have one of those dreams where you wake up and you wish that it wasn't a dream. You know, you're flying or you're doing something amazing. How about this? You preach a sermon and 3,000 people join your church. Now, of course, that would be a big problem because we don't have enough bathrooms for 3,000 people. That would be a real issue. How do you go from 120 to 3,000 people? That's a pretty massive shift. I'm not even sure that would be a good thing. What on earth would you do if you had to disciple 3,000 people out of nowhere? I mean, that would be a huge challenge. I'll take 3,000, but how about over a few years at least, not one day? I'll tell you what, I'll take it in one day, wouldn't you? Amazing to be with there, but something even more miraculous, something pastors want even more than seeing the church go from 120 to 3,000. I'll tell you what, is at the end of the sermon, Peter has just preached this great message And did you catch what they said? This has never happened to me either, just like 3,000 people coming uh, to faith in one day. It said they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the apostles, brothers, what should we do? No one's ever asked me that. Now, it could be Peter was just a bad preacher, and he didn't have an application at the end. He didn't have a call to action. You know, he didn't go to seminary and learn how to preach in a way that doesn't bring 3,000 people to church. I don't know how that worked exactly, but can you imagine at the end of a sermon, someone comes up and says, what should we do? Now, I don't know about you, but as a Lutheran, I have a little bit of an allergy to do, do. Well, wait a minute, we can't say do-do in church, that would be wrong. But you know what I'm saying, with that sense of, we believe everything has already been done, right? Jesus has already accomplished everything needed at the cross, His resurrection opens up the kingdom, anyone that would follow him. And so the idea of having to do anything kind of strikes us as a little bit weird when it already seems like it's already been done. And so Peter does kind of gently correct this a little bit later in the uh, message. He'll say, well, yeah, God calls people to himself. So what happened on this day? Did they choose Jesus or did Jesus choose them? Yes, I think both happened in the same place. And of course, as Lutherans, we embrace that. We want to see people choosing Jesus. We just have a sense, don't we, that God is doing something behind the scenes, that the Holy Spirit didn't leave the building when all that whooshing was happening. In fact, he stayed and has now been calling people throughout the crowd to do, to respond, to embrace whatever is happening. I mean, this is a pretty good first day of church, I think you'd have to say. I mean, they did get, inclu- they did get accused of being drunks earlier, remember? Uh, they said, yeah, yeah, they're speaking other languages, but it's just because they're drinking too much. And Peter said, no, 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 it's too early to be drinking too much. We have the Holy Spirit. And so then he goes into this great message. People respond, what should we do? If you ever want to make me really happy after a sermon on Sunday morning, you can say, don't tell me it was a great sermon. Just say, what should I do? And then I'll just say, grab your wallet, people. Come on. Just uh, <laughs> let's get this thing done. That, no, I don't know what to Ideally, when we ask that question, what is our hearts doing? In fact, the, the scriptures tell us exactly what's going on as Luke records this miracle of Pentecost happening, of Peter's message, of the whole crowd being uh, responding in such a way it says right in verse 37 they were cut to the heart have you ever been cut to the heart i mean that's kind of a graphic image right a very surgical a very messy perhaps very precise but something is going on and if you've ever been in that situation where you've heard a, a song on the radio a friend has mentioned something or in a sunday message or whatever where you felt like the word was just generated right for you, right in that moment, then you know what it's like to be cut to the heart. The heart is a big part of human beings. I mean, it does a lot of important things, wouldn't you say? If it ever stops working, you're in a whole lot of trouble. But spiritually, theologically, the heart is even more important because it's the deepest part of who we are. We think it's our brains, but the Bible treats the heart as the center of our existence. It's the, it's the deepest part of us that makes choices, that connects with God. It's our will, it's our decision making beyond just our kind of up, up in our brain mass kind of decisions, but at our, at our core when we say yes to Jesus, it comes from the heart. And Peter's word to these folks 
is a word we almost never use. But it's the word repent. When was the last time you used the word repent in just common conversation? I mean, it's not a word that you would think of unless you were going to have one of those sandwich signs and say, the end is near, repent, right? That might be a time when Y2K is rolling around next time or whatever it is and you want to change hearts, you put on the repent sign. But when we went to Ukraine, we took a couple of mission trips over to Ukraine, brought some teams and did children and youth ministry there in the big city in western Ukraine called Lviv, and then it's a little town in the, in the middle of nowhere, kind of like Iowa or Minnesota, you know, these little farm towns, if you will, only in Ukraine, and we did a, a children's stuff there, and it was just incredible, but when the church there spoke about people coming to faith, when the church there spoke about people that had uh, been converted or were not in, but that were now in, they kind of reconnected with God, the word they used every time in English was repent. They said, you know, I was doing this, and then I repented. And I said, what would you say? <laughs> I'm an American. I've never heard that word. What do you, what do you mean, repented? What is that? And then, and then, and then we had, we had a, a hundred people come and repent or whatever. They would just use that in such common. And, of course, they were speaking in Ukrainian, but when they were translating into English, it was the same word. It was the word repent, the word that Luke uses, the word that Jesus uses as a way of changing our thinking, changing our direction, having a radical change in our attitude and approach to God, and we just say, I was going this way, but now I'm going to go that way. It's a course correction. It's a change in what we think or where we're headed. But it's not something we often think about. For whatever reason, the word repent escapes us. And yet the end of this really meaningful message where the Holy Spirit is doing his thing around the room and he's enlivening hearts and really changing the world, you know, planting this church in the heart of Jerusalem, the word is repent. And I had to ask myself, why is that word not part of my normal thing? When we were doing our new member class, we looked at Mark chapter 1, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he preaches the good news in Galilee, and he comes and he does what? What is his message? Repent and believe the good news. That's what Jesus said, the first message in Mark, repent and believe the good news. Why is repenting not on our radar, perhaps as much as it could be? It could be because it has kind of a negative connotation, like I'm going to beat myself up, I'm going to treat myself poorly, I'm going to tell myself how bad I am, as if repent means feel lousy about how sinful you are. Well, maybe that's part of it at times. If you're really going the wrong direction and you need to make a U-turn, maybe that's helpful to have some remorse, some sense of guilt, whatever. But that's not the whole of the word. In fact, when Jesus uses it, he's really talking about a radical change that would call people back to him. If you're going 100 miles an hour away from Jesus, repentance says, no, I'm going to do a massive drift, skid around the corner, and I'm going to come back in the direction that Jesus wants me to go. Now, when Peter says this, repent, when Jesus says this, repent, is he only talking about one time? Or do you think repentance is something that we do often. Well, unless you're perfect like me, you only have to do it once. But no, you have to do it all the time, right? You've got to do it every single day. The sense of asking for forgiveness, the sense of wanting to change the direction and get back on the course that God wants us, that's kind of a lifestyle, isn't it? That's a whole approach to living that Peter invites this community into. And he says, the first thing you do is you repent. Now, this could be a huge capital R repentance where you first come to Jesus and you give him your life and you say, Lord, I was lost and now with you I'm found. Or it could be a small R repentance, right, where I'm really, I, you know, I'm already a Christian, but good night, I'm just messing up here. Or I'm missing the mark here. I just need some help here. And then I want to get back on track. But Peter doesn't stop just with repentance because repentance as a solo sport would not be all that helpful. There's 3,000 people that want to know what to do, and Peter gives them something very concrete. He says, change your mind, change your attitude, come back to Jesus, but did you notice what happened next? Now Peter's starting to sound a little bit more like a Lutheran. He says this, repent 
and be baptized. Don't you love that? What is he saying there? Every one of you get baptized. This is the first day. There's no new member class. This is just a, a sermon, right? This is just boom, boom, boom. The church is exploding with growth so fast. They've just got to get this done. But he speaks about baptism as their sins being washed away. We know baptism, as we read the New Testament, has such a, a powerful invitation not just to be clean, but to be welcomed into a family. Remember, when we baptize people, we're saying, you are a child of God. All of a sudden, you went from being outside, far from God, living in this wrathful, crazy world, and all of a sudden now, you have a new identity, you're a new creation, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit as a bonus. Can you imagine? They come to faith, they change their attitude, they're welcomed into the family, and Peter says, you're going to be filled up just like we are. Now, that's a pretty good deal. You can see why all of these people would come to faith. It wasn't like a timeshare presentation when you're like, eh, I don't know if I can swing this. What do you think? You know, Let's make a death pact out in the parking lot so we don't agree to join a timeshare. Right? Have you ever done one of those kind of things? You just say, no matter what they say, if they promise us the moon, we're still going to say no. You know, nothing would stop these people. They, they just heard the word, and they decided they had to act on it right away. They didn't want to go home and think about it. They didn't want to mill it over. All of a sudden, they just were cut to the heart, the center of their being, and they say, what should we do? Peter says, change your attitude about what you've done. And he's thinking specifically about how probably some people in this crowd were there when Jesus was being whipped, when Jesus was being nailed uh, to the cross, when Jesus dies. They're prob they probably know this whole story, and they're probably thinking, yeah, that criminal, he got what he did, or whatever is on their hearts. They need to be transformed, a directional change in a big way. But then Peter invites them into the family. All of a sudden, he says, let's get you all baptized. I mean, I don't know where you find that much water for 3,000 people, right? You're going to need like a super soaker or something at that point, right? You get the fire hose out. All right, everybody hold on, right? I mean, it's a nice problem to have when you've got to baptize 3,000 people. And, of course, they didn't just sprinkle back then. They really dunked them good, right? So they probably made a, a beeline to the river or who knows what they did. But they had to make sure that all these people whose hearts had been changed and reoriented they wanted to make sure they didn't leave without being coming part of the family. Remember what Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel. He says, go, make disciples of all nations, and then what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We want to make sure that people get invited into the family, that they know how precious they are in their identity in Christ. Whatever they thought they were, that gets wiped away, and all of a sudden it's what God thinks about them that matters. They might have been uh, uh, totally against Jesus. They might have been totally in line with the people that killed him. They, who knows what they thought? But now they're thinking something differently, and the deepest part of them is thinking something different. And all of a sudden, they want this community. They want this community gift. Now, I don't know if you remember your baptism. I was baptized as a, a little infant, two, day, two months, two days old. Anybody have any infant baptisms there? Yeah, that's right. You got a few of you Lutherans out there. That's the way we do it, right? So often we get those kids up there. Now, how many of you were confirmed a little bit later? Now, that's a little bit closer to what we're thinking about here with Acts, isn't it? Because they're awake. They're adults at some level. They're, well, are you an adult when you're in eighth grade? I'm not sure. But you're, you know, at some level, you're able to make some decisions. You've got your brain is open. You're ready to decide, is this something for my parents or is this something for me? And at some point, you have to stand up and say, yes, this is my faith, my thing, not someone else's. I'm the one that's all in. And what does baptism in our tradition do? It reminds us. It gives us faith to believe in that grace that God has for us. It helps us have that moment of clarity where we too, like those 3,000 people, could say, yes, I've been cut to the heart 
and I'm all in. Now, I don't remember how you were thinking when you were in eighth grade or whatever you were, but my brain was not exactly fully developed. I don't know that I understood everything I do now. I'd like to think there's been some progress from when I was 12, some, some ups and downs. Anyone agree with that? Has that happened? You're not at the pinnacle of your spiritual development when you're 12 years old. Thank Jesus. That's just the way that it is. There's lots more to go, and I'm guessing if Peter were here, and we asked him what we should do. Followers of Jesus, baptized believers, confirmed Lutherans, we asked him what we should do. I'm guessing the message would be exactly the same. Repent. Every single day, you get up and you say, Lord, I, I may not have done everything I needed to do yesterday. But I'm not going to get on that doo-doo train, right? I'm not going to worry about everything I needed to do. I'm going to claim everything you have already done. And I'm going to change my thinking, change my attitude, orient my direction wherever you might want to go. And the baptism that they receive is so much more than simply church membership. Remember, they don't have official denominations. They don't have buildings. What they have to offer is family and fire. <laughs> Remember, they get the Holy Spirit just like the 12 got, just like the 120 in the upper room got. Now, all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to get good at repentance, it can't just be yourself beating yourself up. That's not going to work. I can't just think, man, I'm so lame. That's not going to be the same thing as true, cut-to-the-heart kind of repentance. It's going to take something else, and this family and this fire is going to make a huge difference. Did you notice the rhythms that they start themselves in? We'll look at these in more detail next week as Peter wraps up this message. But the last verse that Roseanne read said, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Does that sound like anything? <laughs> it sounds a little bit like what we do on Sunday morning, right? Not that I'm an apostle, but good night. What are we doing? We're devoting ourselves to bread and, and the cup. We're coming to communion, right? That's a big deal. Are we praying on this morning? I hope so. Are we reliving the apostles' teaching as we search out the word together? A lot of that is happening. And so when we get in those healthy rhythms, hopefully what God is doing is training us not just to be good church members, but to be good citizens of this world where we can go from here in a different direction. Do you do a lot of repenting on Sunday morning? I don't know. How about Friday night? You do repenting then? I don't know. <laughs> When do people need to repent the most? I'm not sure. You know, you yell at your kids, you have a problem with someone next to you. I mean, I don't know when you need the repentance, but the invitation is in this constant sense of I need to reorient myself where God is calling. But I can't do it alone. If I'm not breaking bread with people that are on this repentance track, I'm going to really put it on the back burner. If I'm not praying with people who are helping me sort out the things I need to repent, the things I need to celebrate, and everything in between, I'm probably not going to get very good at it. If I'm not in the scriptures, hearing from God, learning from the apostles' teaching, as they say in the book of Acts, I'm probably going to miss out on what God might be saying to me in these moments. Now, next week we'll see that the church was not simply a Sunday morning situation. It was in homes during the week. It was much more connected sometimes than we think about it in our day and age. But the call of Jesus, the call of Peter, it's the same. Get good at repenting. Now, some parts of repentance we are particularly good at in the sense of beating ourselves up. Anybody really good at beating yourself up? I can do that really well. But do you have things like even from five or ten years ago that you can replay in your brain and you said, I wish I would have said something different there. I wish I would have done something a little bit different there. That is probably not as helpful as learning how to really repent. Beating ourselves up, probably not going to really help in the long run. 
Now, I get it, because I'm a, a self, uh, 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 I can run those tapes with anyone. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, from yesterday to a week ago to a year ago to 10 years. I mean, we've all got those tapes. But real repentance involves something even greater than that. It's stuff that you actually can change. It's a directional thing. So just going over mistakes, that's probably not going to do it unless there's some sense in which I'm going to actually make a new direction, make a new change, restore a messed up relationship because of some stupid I think thing I said uh, 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago, whatever it might be. Repentance as an approach to life is actually a very Lutheran idea. But for whatever reason, we kind of set it on the shelf. Martin Luther had this great tradition every single morning. They didn't have running water back then, did they? But he had this wash basin in front of him, and he'd always take some water from his kind of morning uh, cleaning up, and he would take some water, he'd make the sign on the cross, of the cross on his forehead, and he would simply say, I'm baptized. What's he doing? He's going back to Acts chapter 2, listening to Peter and say, repent and be baptized, everyone. Well, is he getting rebaptized? No, Lutherans don't believe in getting rebaptized. Once is plenty. You're good, right? But what happens? He's just reclaiming all of the promises of his baptism. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to help him with this journey of repentance. Did Luther ever make any mistakes? <laughs> yeah, we know that. He wrote them down. We look at him and we go, ooh, Luther, could you have just died a few years earlier and not said all those terrible things uh, that you said toward the end of your life? Most of the stuff, really A+, plus, but towards the end, D-, minus, not quite as good. Luther knew, even at his best, right, he was making mistakes every single day, dropping the ball, messing up, and what does he do? He makes the sign of the cross on his forehead and says, I am baptized. And he changes course where Jesus might be leading him. I wonder what kind of course change God might be having you on uh, this morning. If there's some specific thing that immediately when you hear the word repent, as bad as it might sound, you say to yourself, yep, I could probably stand a little bit of that. Well, in the book of Acts, repentance is not just tied to some moment of clarity when it's wrapped up in baptism, when it's wrapped up in community, when it's wrapped up in this meal, we trust it's more than just an opportunity to feel bad. It's an opportunity to feel God's grace once again.